Okay, so the greatest common divisor So sometimes we call this the GCD and Euclid's algorithm. Okay. So let's take two numbers. So for example, 30 and um, 42. Okay. And let's look at the divisors of both of these numbers. So the divisors of 30 are 1, 2, 3, 2, 3, 5, 6, um, 15, and 30. Okay. These are the divisors of 30. And correspondingly, let's look at the divisors of 42. So 42 has the divisors 1, 2, 3, 6, uh, 7, 1, 2, 3, 6, 7, 14, 21, and 42. Okay. So they both have a lot of divisors. But now, now we can we can consider what are called the common divisors. So which divisors are common to both of these? So the common divisors of 30 and 42 is the set of divisors. So you look at what's common. So it's the set of divisors 1, 2, 3, and 6. Okay. And when you, when you observe this set, you will see that, oh, there is a greatest common divisor. So the greatest, the greatest common divisor, the divisor is six. So it's the largest divisor that divides both 30 and 42. So let's formally define the greatest common divisor. So the greatest common divisor, the GCD of, well, let's use, uh, um, you know, let's let's use uh, small uh, letters. So the, the GCD of, you know, M and N. Okay, so they cannot both be zero. Okay, they're both zero, sort of a, uh, uh, a degenerate case. So the, the greatest common divisor of M and N, okay, so this is now a definition, is the largest positive integer that divides M and N. No surprise. Okay. So in particular, it means that the GCD of M and N divides M, because it divides both, and the GCD of M and N divides N, okay, divides both of them, and it's the largest. Now, how could we sort of you know, mathematically sort of state that it's the largest. Okay, so one way, to math math one way to mathematically state that is to say that, suppose you have some other common divisor. So, and if, you know, D is some other common divisor, then it must be the case that the GCD is at least as large as D. Then D is at most the GCD of M and N. So any other common divisor cannot be larger than the GCD because the GCD is the largest. This is the formal mathematical definition of the greatest common divisor. Okay. So um, <coughs> some definitions. So relatively prime. So, we define the primes. So let's consider the GCD, GCD of, you know, a number M and a prime P. Okay, so this is a number M, and this is a prime P. Okay. Well, in this case, the only divisors of P are 1 and P. So either M is a multiple of P, so in which case, you know, the GCD is P. It's P if M is a multiple of P, and otherwise it's one. Otherwise. So let's have let's take an example. So the GCD of you know nine, you know, tw uh, 29, 28, and three. Okay, three is prime. So there are two cases. Either it's equal to three, 
Okay. If 28 is a multiple of 3, in which in this case it's not, so since 28 is not a multiple of 3, the GCD is 1. Okay. Well, on the other hand, the GCD of 27 and 3, well, because 27 is a multiple of 3, the GCD is 3. The, the divisors of any prime are just 1 and itself. Okay. Now, it's possible for the GCD to be 1 even for non-primes. Okay. So let's consider the GCD of um, 8 and 15. So the, the divisors of 8 are 2, you know, 4, 1, 2, 4, and 8. And the divisors of 15 are 1, 3, 5, and 15. So nothing in common, okay, except for 1. So the only common divisor is 1, so the greatest common divisor is 1, so the GCD is 1. Okay, so it's possible for the greatest common divisor to be 1, even if the numbers are not prime. And in this case, we say that these two numbers, with respect to each other, behave as though they are prime. So they are what we call relatively prime. So these two numbers are called relatively prime. So it's possible for, for numbers which are not prime to be relatively prime. If, if one of these were a prime, then it's almost always relatively prime unless the other number is a multiple. Okay. So that's the definition of relatively prime. Okay, now let's talk about computing the greatest, the GCD. And let's take as an example the GCD of, of, uh, of 42 and 30. So let's take as an example the GCD of um, the GCD of um, 42 or let's say 30 and 42. So, how can we compute this? Well, one way is to list out the prime factors, okay, and um, then go and look what's common, and then take the largest thing that's common. Uh, that's a standard way. But Euclid gave a much more powerful algorithm. So that's what we're going to we're, we're going to discuss Euclid's algorithm, and it's so powerful, it's so fundamental to number theory, okay, that it's worth spending a little bit of time. So we're going to talk about Euclid's algorithm. And the basic idea behind Euclid's algorithm is the following theorem. Okay. So Euclid, you know, basically knew the following theorem. So theorem. Okay. Now I'll introduce you to common practice. So first of all, observe that the GCD of M and N is equal to the GCD of N and M. Okay. That's because it's you know you you look at the divisors of you know, the two numbers, and then you, you take the set of common divisors and take the maximum. So it doesn't matter in which order you look at the divisors of the two numbers. So the GCD doesn't depend on the ordering in here. So it's typical that we, when we, when we formulate, you know, a GCD question, we typically put the smaller number on the left and the larger number on the right. Okay. It doesn't have to be the case. This is also the GCD of 42 and 30, but you know, just to make life simpler, we typically assume that the left hand, the left hand input, the first input is smaller than the second input, or smaller equal to. Question: What is the GCD of n and n? So, for example, what is the GCD of thirty and thirty? That's trivial to compute. Okay, and if you have done it before me, you should easily all have convinced yourself that this is thirty. So, the GCD of n and n is thirty. What about the GCD of you know, n of 0 and n. So, for example, the GCD of 0 and 30. What is that? Ah, interesting. And in order to figure this out, you should remember that any number divides 0. So, 30 divides 0, 30 divides 30. So, this is also 30. So, the GCD of 0 and 30, or the GCD of 0 and n is, is, is n. Okay, so, this is n, and this is n. Okay? So some simple facts. Okay, so what did Euclid prove? Euclid proved that the GCD of uh, n and m. Okay, now remember, typically we write that we write this in the form that n is less than m. Okay, because if n is equal to m, it's trivial. It's just equal to n. So we're only interested in the cases where n is strictly less than m. 
uh, although the theorem still holds even if it's not the case that even if you had less equal to. So what 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 Euclid's theorem, uh, well, what Euclid knew, and the theorem that we're going to prove, okay, is that the GCD of a number of two numbers is equal to the GCD of the remainder when you divide m by n. So the remainder when you divide m by n and n. Okay, now let's see if that makes sense. Okay. So the GCD of 30 and 42 okay, is the remainder when you divide 42 by 30. So is equal to the GCD of the remainder when you divide 42 by 30. Well, when you divide 42 by 30, you get 12 okay, and 30. Now notice that 12 is less than 30, so it's in the right order according to our convention. And why is that? Why that is, is because the remainder when you divide by n is always less than n. Okay. And that's coming from the quotient remainder theorem that we already discussed. Okay. Ah! Okay. But if that theorem really is true, then it should also apply to this guy. So this should equal the GCD okay, of... You know, the, re the remainder when 30 is divided by 12, so that remainder is 6, okay, because 2 times 12 is 24, and then the remainder is 6 gets you up to 30. So that's 6 and 12. Okay. Ah, but if that theorem really is true, it should apply to the GCD of 6 and 12. Okay, so what is that? That's equal to the GCD of the remainder when 12 is divided by 6, but the remainder when 12 is divided by 6 is 0, because 6 divides 12. So that's 0 and 6. Ah! But we know that the GCD of 0 with anything is that number 6. So this is equal to 6. Oh, it's the same thing we got before, which is good. Okay. It's very good that, you know, when you computed the GCD, when we computed it by hand, and we computed it using a theorem that's supposedly true, we, we get the same answer. Okay. So this is an example of that theorem in action. It's that we can reduce the GCD computation to what looks like a slightly smaller problem. Because look, the numbers here are all smaller than the numbers here. Well, the 30 remains, but then we, got, we replaced 42 by 12. In fact, we guaranteed to replace 42 by something less than 30. And since 42 was um, bigger than 30 to start with, if we replace it by something that's less than 30, then it's going to be much smaller than 42. Okay. It turns out that this algorithm for computing the GCD is very, very fast. And we'll illustrate with another example soon. Okay. So let's prove that theorem. And in proving that theorem, I'm going to show you the typical way in which GCD proofs take place. Okay, so we're going to prove that theorem. Wow, why, why, why do we have to prove things? Oh, because, you know, well, first of all, this is a math class. And in math, we only believe things after they are proved. And second of all, look at how powerful that algorithm is. It allows us to compute GCDs very fast. Okay. So do we believe that? Does it always work? Let's prove it. Proof. So typically, we're saying that one GCD, let's call this D, is equal to another GCD, let's call this D prime. Okay. So we're saying that two GCDs are equal to each other. Okay. So, you know, there are two ways, I mean, there are many ways to prove this, but, you know, the way that we typically follow is to say, well, if they're, e if they're really equal, then it means that D is less equal to D prime. Okay. And it also means that D is greater or equal to D prime. And the only way that both can be true is if they're equal. D equals D prime. So this is the typical way in which we ap uh, approach a GCD proof. Okay. And so now, how do we prove that, the D, that, that D is less equal to D prime? So how to prove this? Question mark. Okay. Well, we know that D prime is the largest common divisor of these two numbers. So if we can prove that D is a common divisor of these two numbers, then since D prime is the largest common divisor, then D must be less equal to D prime. So that's our idea in the proof. So the idea here is idea, idea, show that D divides the remainder of, you know, when, when M is divided by N and D divides N. So D divides this guy, D divides that guy, and if D divides both, then it cannot be larger than the 
greatest common divisor, which means it has to be less equal to the greatest common divisor. So let's show that. Okay. So D divides N, okay, because D is a common divisor of N and N. D divides N. Okay. Okay. Now, what is the remainder? Rem remember, you're dividing M by N. So M is equal to Q times N plus a remainder. And that's what this guy is. Okay. So this R is the remainder when M is divided by N. Okay. That's the definition of the remainder. Okay, but let's see. The remainder R is equal to M minus QN. Okay. So D divides M, D divides M, and D divides N. So D divides QN. So D divides N and D divides QN. That implies, so this is a sum of two things that D divides and one of our divisibility facts. This means that D divides R. So we have proved that D divides, i.e. D divides the remainder of M and when, when M is divided by N. And by, by, by construction, by the definition of D, D divides N. Okay, so D divides N. So D is a common divisor. D is a common divisor. Therefore, D is less equal to D prime. Very similar proof allows us to show that D is at least D prime because what, what's the proof idea? The idea. Let's prove that D prime is a divisor of N and D prime is a divisor of M. So D prime is a common divisor of N and M. If it's a common divisor of N and M, it cannot be larger than D, the largest common divisor of M and N. So therefore, it's less equal to the largest common divisor of N and M, i.e. it's less equal to D. So we want to prove that D prime is less equal to D. Idea, show D prime divides N and D prime divides N. M. So let's prove it. D prime divides um, the, re the remainder, so it divides M minus QN. And we know that D prime divides N, because it's a common divisor, in particular the largest common divisor. So D prime divides um, N. Okay. And this is one of our, our divisibility facts. If you divide a sum, and you divide one of the terms in the sum, then you must divide the other term. So by our, our divisibility facts, this means that D prime divides M. Because it divides, D prime divides a sum, it divides one of the terms in the sum, and therefore it must divide the other term. Okay. So D prime divides M, D prime divides N. So D prime divides M and N. It divides both M and N. Exactly what we wanted to show. So this means that D prime is less equal to D because D is the largest divisor of M and N. That proves this fundamental theorem. Okay, that proves this fundamental theorem. So let me erase this and let's come back and do another example.